Waiting for Pops to get online. Pops, where you at, my guy? I'm right here, fam. Yo, bro, you know, like, you know, it's my first time. Forget this out. You know, yeah, I can see. I can see. What's good, man? What's good? What's up, man? Nothing much, man. Just playing, just playing the crib, just playing the house, man. You know, interesting times these days, man. So just trying to figure things out over here, man. How about yourself? Hey, listen, man. This is uh, it's my first time ever doing live, so bear with me. <laughs> I know. Oh, man, I like you know, a millennial in this thing, either. Listen, it sounds crazy, but I, I don't know how to work this thing. But I'm gonna, I wanna get along with it. That's why I let you do it first, cause I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a novice myself. All right, cool, cool. Well, no, like, um, you know, like you said, we gotta let everyone know, um, obviously, why we're here, mm -hmm. um, why we wanna do this, why we decided that it's the right time to kind of, you know, tell our story. Yeah, for sure. I definitely think it's. Um especially in this day and age with everything that's going on to with us being limited to, to pretty much the whole world being limited to their homes. It was, uh, it was good that we, we come together and at least tell our own stories for the longest athletes and, you know, guys on this side of the game don't ever get the chance or opportunity to, uh, to tell their truths and tell their own stories. So, you know, I think it's good that we give, give the people what they want and tell them, uh, tell them about you know our upbringing and our paths and getting to the nba and you know life after basketball africa and stuff like that so i definitely feel like this is um this is long overdue fam yeah no i think uh you know the the unique thing about it is you know our our path um uh, it's kind of unique because you know you're talking about you know being from africa and growing up in the uk um you know, what we had to go through in terms of what basketball means to that, you know, uh, to, to kids in the UK, but also people that are involved within the basketball community, mm -hmm. uh, the struggles that come with it, but also, you know, working your way to come to the US and trying to make a name for yourself to get a scholarship. Um, and, and, and obviously the process that we took involves, you know, we touch up on a lot of people and what they're going through, whether it's people in Africa, people in the UK, people in the US, what we're doing now with our careers and what we're trying mm -hmm. to bring back to, to, to obviously Africa, to the UK. So this is why I think it's important that we kind of tell our story, um, how we came up, but also along the way, the good and the bad and you know, what shaped you and everything. Yeah, that's that's interesting because if you think about it, for the longest, people only ever see the finished product. They only see what, um, you know, they only see us on the court. They don't really get to see the work that you put in and the, the long hours and the struggles that you have to go through to get to that point. And I think um, it's a generational thing. It's, there's a difference between uh, us trying to make it and, you know, players of today trying to get there too i think it's a it's a mindset thing i think um you know i want to speak for you but for us it was like no choice we didn't have any choice but to make it and it was like uh, our backs were against the wall and we felt like we um if we didn't make it we didn't know who would who would so we, again taking up on ourselves to try to get to that point is, is is big but you know i see more and more people are signing on. So, you know, we'll give it a few minutes before we really get into it. I see no, Jacob's no. on there. He's taking a break from taking doing push-ups. So, <laughs> so we know he, he's on. Who else have we got here? I t listen, I told you I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm starting uh, to, to figure this out. So bear with me, all right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can, while we're waiting, you can just say, what's up? Who, who's that? Who's that? Hope no. There goes J-Rob. Another South Londoner. Uh, hey, listen. Wait, I, don't wait, I, said, yo, yo. I don't respond to men from South London like that. You know that. So, listen. So no every, from South listen, London. Listen, we're not going to go there because we already know where you're from. You know, we're, we're not going to. You want to know where I'm from? We're not going to know where I'm from. Listen. Oh, you want to know where I'm oh, from? Oh, do you want to know where I'm from? Listen, that's do the worst thing. Listen, from? it's the worst do thing you, you can do in this, uh, in this live thing. Being a Tottenham fan is the worst thing you could do. Nah, man. Born and bred, bruv. This is me. This is where no, I'm I, from. Tottenham I High Road. No, I understand huh? that, but isn't a, there's, there isn't a lot to celebrate there. Except maybe may finishing fifth one time. 
Uh, uh, so what's, what's Arsenal doing these days, bro? Are you guys still playing football over there? Oh, uh, we want to talk about these days. These days. I mean, nobody's I mean, let's doing just, anything. Nah, let's nobody's just talk doing about anything the history. Right now. I mean, we want to talk about the whole thing. You're not just going to mention somebody when they're 30. You want to talk about them from day one till they're 30, yeah? Right, but I'm going to just what is. Where you, where are you from in London? How about that one? Let's start with that one. I'm from South London. Okay. Where is Arsenal? Worldwide. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. You know, Arsenal got fans all over, man. That's you know, that's Africa's team too. So, nah, don't even so, go so this there. is me. So when people ask me why am I a Tottenham fan, I explain to them that I was born and raised on Tottenham High Road. Yeah, but I tell you exactly why. Listen, I'm an Arsenal fan for many reasons, right? Not okay. only is Arsenal known for having so many African players, but Ian Wright is from South. I don't know about so no, many. No, no, let me just. Tell I don't know you about so many. Started. Let's not get crazy, bro. What I don't mean? know about so many. What do you mean? What's so many? You said so many African players. What's bro, so many? Arsenal had so many players, man. So many African players. Even There's if you a couple. To, you know, it's only been Mozilla. one team. No, it's only, wants it's to only ever been one team undefeated, and there was a lot of Africans in that team. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, I mean, but anyway, listen, a lot of people are logging on. Right, right, so, right. Let's let's since we're talking about it, let's let's talk about where you're from in London. Let's talk a little bit about you know, because a lot of people understand, you know, when you're from London, you you know, we go back and forth, uh, not just the right. football teams, but South London, North London, East London, all that stuff. So you know, a lot of people don't really know where in London you're from, because you know, when we're in the U.S., we just say you know, I grew up in London. That's it. Right, right. You know? So you know. For me personally, and it's funny because people don't often don't think I have an accent, but um, Africa doesn't love Arsenal, by the way. I don't know who just wrote that, but we don't do that. Africa doesn't love Arsenal. Someone just put Tottenham. Yeah, in, exactly. the, in the wrong, the in the wrong end, in it? Someone said Ian Wright from South, London, South Sudan. <laughs> Listen, we take Ian Wright any day. Um, <laughs> we take him right. any day. So, so um, yeah, so for me, you know, being from Tottenham, born and bred my whole life, uh, you know, I grew up on Tottenham High Road, went to primary school in Tottenham, secondary school, and was was playing football and, and running track when I was growing up. And it was um, interesting because all my friends were not only African or, or Caribbean, but they all played sports too. And, you know, one thing that sports did for me at a young age was um because i grew up with so many siblings i was i'm extrovert so i get all my energy from other people and i felt like as soon as i started playing team sports that's when i realized yo i love being around people i love inspiring people i love just accomplishing something with the team and that's when my love of you know team sports kind of started but you know when i ran track i was by myself um that's a whole nother conversation but when uh <laughs> when i when I when I ran track, I was kind of by myself, and um, but you know, football for me at a young age was, and I know you say you're so you're so good that you probably could have played pro. That's a whole nother conversation, though. I don't I was, know. Listen, so. I wasn't just good; I was nice, man. What does that was, mean, though? There's no was, there's, like we know about me and track. You we hear you. You know what? I give listen, you when you go, there, listen, sir. go to South London and ask about Michael Dang, man. Everyone will tell you about my <laughs> hey, hey, you gotta tell the story. Hey, look, 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 no, 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 Growing up, I started playing basketball, and my coach, um, <laughs> my coach Joe White, um, you know, he's the type of coach who you would bend over backwards to get his approval. Like for me, my whole career has gone by. I never looked for too many people's approval, but he had that the the way he inspired and empowered people. You always wanted his approval, and you know what he used to do. Like, I'm 83 and you're a couple years behind me. He would always be like, no, there's a kid in South London called Michael Deng. And he's better than all of you. <laughs> he said he's better than all of you. Yeah. You know, Joe, like, yo, what, huh? you know, till today, uh, Joe was the first guy to tell me you're going to be a pro. Uh, yeah, and this that. was, yeah, this was before, this was in high school. My school, St. Mary's. 
uh, in Croydon. We were playing against uh, Joe White's school. He was uh, coaching uh, some school up north. Humpton, Humpton House, Humpton House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we played them. And I remember we. Wait, beat can you him. see my Tottenham shirt? I just make sure we can see my Tottenham shirt. It's making the whole thing messed up. I mean, I should have got the. I really should have got the memo because I'm sure all my Arsenal fans are mad at me right the now. The memo. If you're a fan, you're a fan. Nobody had to tell me anything. They just had to be like, "Look, we're going on live," and I was like, "I'm letting the people Bruh, know." We're going on live as a team. You, you gotta let me know. This is how you up. You know, one up somebody. You gotta let me know, like, yo, by the see, way. See, like, see. yo, by the way, like, I'm gonna. <laughs> Like, no, I'm gonna wear my top you decided to wear your shirt, and I decided to wear my shirt. Cause no, I, I wore believe. Thomas Sankara because I, you know, it's just it was random. It wasn't planned Respect. or nothing. Respect. But I was worried about you wearing the suit. To be honest with you, I was just worried that you know it's not a business meeting. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was. No, like, I'm a suit now. Yeah, I'm a suit. But I've been locked in the house for what two, three weeks now. I don't even remember the last time I put something. Um, you guys are lucky I have trousers with pants on right now, to be honest. Damn. No, no, no. <laughs> this is 3, this 3 p.m., bro. But, <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, talking, talking about just, you know, growing up. So, Michael Deng, let me tell you the story. So, uh, basically, for those that don't know, um, I was Michael Deng till I was 14, maybe even 15. Uh, no, until we got to the U.S., bro. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I left. I came to the U.S. when I was 14. But I, my first year, my freshman year in high school, I was still Michael Deng. Uh, but let me tell you guys how it started. So, obviously, growing up, uh, being from South Sudan with, you know, the unrest and the civil war and everything, we fled. When I was a young kid, we fled to Egypt. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but I'm fluent in Arabic. I grew up in Egypt. Oh, to cut him out of me. To cut him out of me. Oh, okay. Okay. I was cut him out of me. I spoke a little Arabic too now, huh? <laughs> Listen, we're not going to tell the story about that part. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so anyway. Uh, so, yeah, at the age of 10, we moved to uh, to England uh, from, from Egypt. But people, a lot of people don't know this. We moved to Wimbledon first. We used to live in Wimbledon. Uh, we lived there for almost a year. Um, when we were, when we got to Wimbledon, um, I always felt, you know, we went to school in Wimbledon and I was telling people, you know, Luol, you know, Luol, Luol. And I was young, obviously, and I had to keep correcting people. So I had this thing in my mind, like, oh, why can't people say my name? And it bothered me, you know, it kept bothering me. So, and I will talk about it later on as part of my motivation, but it kept bothering me. How, why you not know my name? Why can't you say it? You know, um, uh, so we moved. We moved from Wimbledon and we went to South, uh, South Norwood, Croydon, and we went to a Catholic school, St. Mary's. Well, we went to school. The first thing they asked me was, what's your Catholic name? You know, and I remember we used to go to Sunday school. We used to go to church. And when I was baptized, I was, you know, named Michael, St. Michael, right? So I went with it. So the first day I said, Michael, you know, I barely spoke English. So I said, yeah, Michael. So next thing you know is, yo, Michael Deng, Michael Deng. So I was like, yo. Everyone is saying my name with ease. So I, you know, so I went with it. So I went with Michael. But it wasn't just Michael. It was always Michael Deng, Michael Deng. You right. know, there's a lot of Michael, so it's Michael Deng. So when I went to the school in the U.S., I went to school, and believe it or not, this is a true story, and I always tell my friend Richie Yu, the name Deng is very popular in China. So when <laughs> I... <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> it's, it's very popular in China, the name Deng. So when, when they sent my school report, uh, to, to my high school, they put uh, Michael Deng. So all the Asian kids in school thought that it was a kid coming from China, all right? So when I showed up uh, in a common room, they had a party waiting for me, and I went by Michael Deng. So I just rolled with it. So I just, the school report was Michael Deng. So I went with Michael Deng. So halfway throughout the year, I went to my high school coach, Joe Mantegna, and I said, Coach, you know my name is not Michael. <laughs> <laughs> South and London that, movements, boy. That's how they move in South London, you know. <laughs> nah, I said, nah, man. I said, my name is not Michael. He said, this is halfway throughout through the year. So he's like, so what's your name? I said, my name is Luol. He's like, what? <laughs> and then from there on, uh, my coach made it, you know, uh, a goal to let everyone know that my name was Luol. So we had a school meeting in front of the whole school. My coach went up and he said, you know, Michael... It's actually Luol. So from now on, we're going to call him Luol. Yeah, but that's that's my story with... Uh... That's, that's, that's funny. That's funny because um, 
that leads to the next point I was I was gonna make. Like growing up African in 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 those times, it was uh it was it was a task, bro, because you know you grow up in a stage where everybody wants to be um where everybody wants to fit in, everybody wants to be the same, and uh, you know f similar to you, people just used to call me. My first name is Nana. Mm. Oh, Nana. That's how yeah. they say it, Nana. Yeah. And from the day I was born, my parents never said my first name. So my middle name is Papa, but it's, I only have that only because I was named after my dad. Mm. But I, I have his middle name as my first name. And it's, it's, I don't know, it's backwards, but I was named after my dad, so they called me Papa. So my mom and dad always called me Pups. But yeah. what's funny was all throughout primary school and secondary school, I nobody ever called me pops. Nobody called me by my name at home. So I had these two separate um, at home and then at school. Yeah. And because I'm always trying to fit in, and I was the big, skinny, goofy. And you know I had a jerry curl when I was young. <laughs> Yo, I asked you to post some pictures when you were young. No, nah, there's like, only I, two pictures. There's how do you ask someone pictures. to post pictures when you're young and, and their answer is, all my pictures, I'm dunking on somebody. No, we, I didn't. we had to put. You said we, a picture of me playing basketball. I don't have a picture of me playing basketball. Bro, I said pictures just from the ends. I said, look, I'm gonna put a picture like Brixton. We said playing so though. It we said, said Brixton. Playing. So give me a picture like North London. And this guy goes, um, bro, all my pictures when I was growing up, I was dunking on somebody. <laughs> so they only Where's took the proof? pictures. So they only took pictures when you dunked on somebody, or was every move a dunk? Every like you walked in the court just dunking the whole time. Like, come on, bro. <laughs> All the pictures that the people want to see are me dunking on people. All the rest I of them. See, I, uh, I see. I see people commenting Jerry curl, bro. We gotta nah, see nah, a picture. Yo, you guys relax. We gotta, relax. See, I we gotta you see about the Jericho picture. part already. Let's not get crazy, okay? Like nah, I, but, I Jericho. There's only two pictures that exist. Uh, there's only two <laughs> pictures that exist of me having a Jericho. And so I say all that to say is, you grow up. I was taller than everybody else. I was dark. I was skinny. I had a curl, and I was the African kid, and I tried so hard to fit in. All I wanted to do was fit in. And my middle name is is, is Drene, but it's spelled D-W-E-N-E. -E. So I, I didn't, even, I didn't even know. How many middle names do you have, bro? Bro, there's, there's, there's a good amount. I don't think those are... I don't think we call them middle names. I think they just they just names, right? They just names. <laughs> I think a middle name gotta be in the middle, no? Yeah. <laughs> so what's your uh, name all over the place? But now nah, go ahead. Yeah, no, nah, um, so well, my full name is Nana Papayao Drine Mensa Bonsu. Mm. So that's where all all my name derives from. Um so yeah, uh, I had that. So I used to just go around telling people my name was Dwayne. Dwayne. Dwayne, so what? I could be cool. <laughs> so I could be cool with fit. And like, you have to understand, I was, you have to understand, some of the names that I was taught, you know what? You know how many wait, wait, why Dwayne? Why you know, Dwayne? Because you know, like, Dwayne, and it looked like it was spelled Dwayne. <laughs> Bro, come on. So Yo, <laughs> it looked like, it looked like, uh, it looked like, um, it looked like Dwayne. So they was like, how do you say that? I was like, oh, it's Dwayne. It's just how we spell it in Ghana. How many Ghanaians do you know called Dwayne? Bro, but what? <laughs> who was calling you Dwayne in school? No, they didn't. So I would just tell them that was my middle name so I could just be cool and be one of the kids. Because my name was Nana. And they was like, what kind of name is that, bro? Like, they was calling me Nana, Nana, the Black Banana. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, man. That, that's, and these are my friends. These are my friends. <laughs> These are my friends, bro. I never heard of Dwayne, man. Yeah, heard, imagine, I, I imagine, the imagine the people who didn't like me. These are my friends making fun of me. Now imagine the people who didn't like me. You know what I'm saying? So I, yeah. so I, so I was just trying my best to fit in, and 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 be like, yeah, my middle name is Dwayne. I just go by my first name though, because that's just what the girl them call me. You know. So, <laughs> so, so, so the, the girl. So from now on, like we gotta find some people who know who knew Dwayne. I'm sure somebody's gonna log on and be like, "Yo, I've been telling people his name was Dwayne." <laughs> yeah, him. but him. so, 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 so to your Michael story, to your Michael story, I remember coming over, and so you went to Blair, and I went to Hunt, and we'll get to to going in depth about that another time, but. I remember just getting to the U.S. for the first time, and they was like, "You're about to play against Blair." I was like, "Oh, my boy plays for Blair," and they was like, "Who is it?" I was like, "It's Michael, uh, Michael Deng." They was like, "Oh, 
His name's not Michael. His name is Luar. I was like, what are you talking about? I know, man. The man's from, my, man's from London. His name is, is Michael. And they showed me, and it was like, no, nah, it says Luau. And I was like, and I'm, and I'm walking up to you. I'm like, bro, what? Who, who's this brother that you're talking about? <laughs> who's this yeah. Luau brother? Listen, I'm holding, I'm holding back so many stories of high school and how you just destroyed what, you know, I, I'm not even going to go there yet. I'm going to wait till we what get to that episode. I'm, I'm talking about the okay, track and yeah, field. Yeah. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Don't, that time will come. Yeah, that's, 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 but, yeah, that's, but, that's, you know, that's, going that's back, another thing, bro. Going back, going back to, you know, growing up um, in London, obviously South and North, yeah. You know, I want to talk a little bit about back in the days, what made the competition so tough. Um, and I think, you know, for me, I always say we came in a time in an era where, you know, people might disagree or whatever, but that was basketball at its highest level in the UK. Uh, yeah. And we were lucky that we were young at that age because all those guys before us took it so serious. The competition was so tough that as a young kid, you had no choice but to try to be good. And, and the crazy thing is I try to tell people, I've always wanted to be in the NBA, but before that, it was almost I wanted to make Brixton proud. Uh, and it was, you know, being from South London, and I'm sure it's the same for you, but being from South London, I was like, yo, I can't have anyone from North London, you know, being the guy everyone talk about, or we can't it's have, what, you know, when it, when it came to Rough and Ready, when I was young and I was watching, I was like, yo, it's going to be us soon. You know, so we were cheering for, you know, the, the older guys, like, yo, you can't, South can't lose to North. You know, you can't lose yes. to eat. You got to win it, you know. And those are our superstars. So I want to go back to that time of it's missing now in the UK, you know. So I want to talk about the competition growing up and just the level of, I don't know how it was for you guys, but we looked at you guys as we, we can't let you guys be better than us. We, we got to be better than you guys, you know. Man, that's, that's a great point, man. So if you think about it, what's crazy for me, like, that kind of coincides with, like, how I started playing the game. So my older brother was, you know, my older brother Kojo just randomly started playing basketball. Uh, he you know, he played in Brixton, just to let people know. So I'm going to get there, bro. I'm going to get there. Okay, okay. there. No, nah, because they need so to know. Just trying they to claim to somebody from that, North London. No, nah, no, nah, they need to know that, you know, Pops Oh, we're going to get to it because I see Matthew Ryder's on here and I, I have some stuff for him too. So, you had a lot of influence from the South, man, I'm just saying. No, he influenced the South. What do you mean? He left and came to us. He knew. The influence anyway, anyway, we'll we brought to North we'll to London we'll, to no, South. No, we'll get to that later. Kojo knows. We'll bring him on one day. Yeah, you know? for sure. So, right. so basically, so my brother, who I always looked up to when I was younger, he started. He randomly just started playing, and then all of a sudden, was gone. We just gone to the U.S. And I was young. I was probably ten, eleven at the time. I didn't know what was going on. And um, he tells, and I find out he's playing basketball. So that's where my 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 basketball experience kind of started so i remember i remember going my first basketball experience was it was a thing called wicb and some of them men who grew up playing basketball in, in south london um should know it it was we went to brixton rec and i remember seeing all these men from all these older men from south london and my brother and jimmy and i'm like who's this guy with this funny accent and, you know, Jimmy's got that, that Welsh accent, so I didn't know what was going on. So I'm just soaking this all in. I know nothing about the game. I know nothing about what's going on. I just know my older brother there who I look up to and I want to be like, and he's playing the sport. So immediately I was enamored with it. And I remember he leaves to go to the U.S. And all of a sudden my dad comes to me one day and it's like, it's, it's like a Wednesday afternoon. And I'm just getting home from school and I'm sitting there watching TV. And he's like, Put your put your sneakers on. Put your trainers on, and let's go. I'm thinking, what, what's what's he talking about? So where are we going at this time? So I'm, I don't ask no questions. Put my my shoes on, and we just drive to to East London. We go to Hackney, mm. and I remember walking in, and I see the biggest person I've ever met in my life <laughs> in Joe White, about six eight, six six eight, about three hundred pounds. So he's like the most intimidating figure I've ever seen, and. I was like, I'm looking at my dad like, what is this? What are we doing? And he just like, and Joe's like, go. They throw me into a, a three-man weave, and that was it. And that's how basketball yeah. started for me. Nah, that's crazy, man. <clears throat> you know, I was talking about your brother. You know, it was similar for me with uh, my older brother, Joe. 
you know, when, when, um, uh, when I ended up going to Brixton at first, I didn't want to go. Um, like I said, Marco Deng was nice at football, man. This was, proper. <laughs> nah, this was serious, you know, it's Crystal Palace or Arsenal. You know, pick or choose. No, no, no. Let me stop. It's so funny. Are there any kids on here? It's so funny. Are there any kids on here? Because both teams are shit, mate. It doesn't matter. But anyway. They're in the Premier League. What are you talking about? (laughs) Listen, Crystal Palace is probably going to win a title before Tottenham does. And you've been there the whole time. I don't even know. Tottenham been in the Premier League since when? It ain't no anything. Anyway, anyway. So look, my whole thing is when it comes to football, yeah. I'm so arrogant. When it comes to basketball, I'm humble, isn't it? So, <laughs> you know what's no, funny? No. That's exactly what it's like for me for track. And sorry to interrupt, but that's exactly how my pro. Like, I wasn't naturally gifted at basketball. I had to work to that. But when it came to track, I swear to you, that's the one sport I feel like I was put on this earth to play. But you know, it's you know what it is though. It's you know when you're younger. When you're younger, you were better than everyone. The same with me with football. So you have all this, like, record and trophies. And so you could back it up. You know, when you become a pro, you know, there's other guys <laughs> over there are better than you. And what you did as a, you know, as a professional. So you're like, you got to let me step back a little bit before someone comes in. But listen, when it comes to Michael Deck, undefeated. But, yeah. <laughs> now, nah, but um, so for me with my brother, it was the same. So... I didn't want to go to Brixton. I knew my brother was good at basketball, but I wanted to be a football player. And my brothers kept trying to tell me, come to Brixton, kept trying to force me, you know. So I just went. One day I just went. Um, I think I was about 11, and I went. um, And I started playing. I started playing with the older guys, playing with my brother, with the juniors. And when I finished playing, Jimmy came over, and Jimmy started talking to my brother, but Jimmy was like talking to my brother because I was tall when I was young. So Jimmy was talking to my brother as if, you know, I'm 15 or 16, you know, or 14, whatever. So Jimmy's talking and then my brother's like, yo, my brother's not even 12 yet. And, uh, and Jimmy's like, what? And he's like, he's not 12 yet. And, you know, everyone who knows Jimmy, Jimmy just switched everything as if I've been coming for years. Hey, man, this is the wall. He's going to be great. <laughs> was, was it the one or Michael though? He's was like, it? huh? No, I was, was Michael it? then. I was uh. Michael. He's like, listen, you're coming in every day. This is practice. Um, and it just slowly I started coming to Brixton and I started to feel the love. I started to feel that, you know, it was a community. And what Jimmy's done and what Joe has done and what's missing now in London, I feel, is that type of community where when you walked in there, you knew those, your brothers and sisters. It was, you know, we're all down for each other. It didn't even matter. You know, I went to Brixton. It didn't matter who you, run, you ran into. They knew someone that played basketball. And it was a free pass for whatever you wanted to do. You know, mm-hmm. people looked out for each other. And everyone knew Jimmy. If you got in trouble, people went back to Jimmy. You know, and Jimmy and Joe, I'm sure the same thing. They put so much discipline that seeing that as a young kid, I just started drawing you know, I started coming to towards this side more, which is Brixton side, uh, instead of football. And then, you know, at 13, going to 14, I made up my mind that, you know, this is really what I wanted to do. But it took me, it took me a little while to actually say, you know what, basketball is it. That's, that's a good point you make. And it's funny because, you know, we'll get into more depth when talking about track and stuff like that over there. But when I was... Like like I said, I was running, I was I was playing football and running track, and it took me. I had to travel an hour to get from Tottenham to Hackney just to go to to, to practice. And again, I, like basketball was great, and um, it was a sport that I liked, but I didn't love it at a young age. And I remember what's crazy. Joe comes to me and is like, "Look, Joe was he was a PE teacher and a math teacher at Humpton Humpton." Um, hospital which is in Hackney so a lot of people didn't know that he used to give us homework so he comes to me one day and is like look if you're really serious about basketball do you um you'll you'll tell your parents you want to come to home and to home and high and it was an all boys school and at 12 13 I'm like nah man <laughs> a man's not moving like that I'm not I'm not going to an all boys school and I told I, I lied to him I told Joe that um, I went to my parents and they wanted me to go to a Catholic school and I couldn't go to school all the way in Hackney. And like uh, maybe 10, 10 some odd years later, I remember that conversation and it, um, man, it, it broke me down because I was like, man, if I was serious about basketball, 
imagine what would have happened had I gone to Homer and, and been around the game all the time. Because I stopped playing for a year. Because it was affecting me traveling an hour from from school, after school, messing around with my friends, and then getting the training late most of the time. And it was affecting my schoolwork and my homework. And my parents were not playing that. Yeah. I was, my parents were not playing uh, my grades being messed up for a sport that they, they didn't really know much about. Yeah. So my dad was like, I can't go, I can't go to training anymore. And I remember Joe coming to my house and like asking my dad what, like what's going on. And my, and my dad told him and Joe in front of my dad punches me in the chest. <laughs> he punches me in the chest and was like, yo, what are you doing? And immediately I got in line. School, track, football, basketball. I had everything in order. I did my schoolwork because I knew it was going to affect me from playing, and I wanted to and I wanted to please Joe. So I wanted to make sure that I did um, everything in school that I had to do so that I could go training. And as I started to develop and get better, I was like, man, I may not be great at this sport yet, but I think there's a chance that I could. I I, I know I love it. I know I love it. And when the first um, Rough and Ready, and I saw Kojo, my brother, playing in Rough and Ready, I was like, that was the pinnacle for me. That's where I wanted to go. I was like, when I see, if I'm able to get to the Rough and Ready stage, I've made it. Not even the NBA, not even Division One, not even yeah. high school in the US. If I get yeah. to play on that Rough and Ready stage, yeah. then I know I've made it. Then I know I've, mm -hmm. I've accomplished something. And that was my, that was my, that was my goal. At a, at a young age and you know as an 83 we used to determine what age group you were by what year you were born so as 83s i wasn't even one of the better 83s in my um in my age group yeah and remember i told you joe used to use um <laughs> joe used to use uh other players as inspiration so you remember Midgley, Richard Midgley. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard Midgley at 13, 14 was the best 13, 14 year old I had ever nah, seen in my he, life. He was, cold, he was cold, bro. Yeah, he was, uh, and, and Joe was like, oh, you guys think you're good. This guy, he had 100 points in the game. I'm like, <laughs> it's like I'm just learning how to make a left handed layup. And this kid's over here um, um, scoring 100 points in the game. And so, like, I see guys like him, I see guys like yourself, Andrew Sullivan, Olu. You know, all those guys. Um, even Marcus. I mean, Mar I remember thinking about Marcus when I was... Machine gun. Mar yeah. Machine gun Marcus. Uh, <laughs> Marcus was that guy. I was like, yo, Mar yeah, he was serious at a young age. Yeah. I just remember seeing his play. And, um, you, know, you know, I was like, look, I got to get to that rough and ready stage. Like, how do yeah. I do it? You know, the crazy thing is, and I, I want to go a little bit because there's so many things that happen, you know, throughout when we were in London, that just changes your mindset. You know, I mm -hmm. always say that events that stick with you, uh, whether you're working out, whether, you know, when you go to the U.S. or whatever you're doing, something that happened that sticks with you, that makes you want to push yourself. Because I know there's a lot of kids in the, in the U.K. that don't get the opportunity to hear this because we went through what they're going through uh, mm -hmm. now. You know what I mean? So for me, you know, the rough and ready and everything, and I always say in Brixton, Brixton, our practices were like the competition, you know, like we, we mm -hmm. went after each other. Jimmy made it a thing where we, if somebody messed up, we were all getting punished. If someone didn't touch the line, we were all crouching. We were going to the end and back. And you're learning those things at a young, you know, at a young age. Mm -hmm. For me, like you said, you know, Marcus, Lakin, staff, all the guys that came from Lewisham and kind of joined Brixton, to me, you know, added a little, you know, uh, competitiveness and a little toughness to Brixton to our team and we even you know I'm not talking about the era before those guys you know Marv, Joe, Demola, Ugana mm -hmm. those guys you know dominated we came in afterward and then when we got those guys we're like yo we just as we just had an edge to ourselves right but I remember for me we went up to Brighton I never forget this man because it was my turning uh, point for me and I was the youngest in the team uh, this was, you know, the finals or the semifinal. No, no, this was during the season. I'm sorry, because we met them later in the, in the semifinal. We beat them. Mm -hmm. But during the season, we got on the train and we took the train to Birmingham, like a long trip. But, you know, back in the days, we all rode together. And, that, you know, I wish I could bring those days back. But we went right. to Brighton and we lost by 55 points. Wow. Right. And I remember on the way back, this, I was 
12, 13, around that age. I remember on the way back on the train, I said, yo, this is never happening again. You know, like I just, I felt so embarrassed, but there was something that we felt like we failed. We felt like we let Jimmy down. And that was the changing point of me. And, and from then on, I worked so hard. But like what you said earlier, for it to be rough already was your kind of the ceiling. For me, it was a nobody in the UK. Nobody is going to mess with us anymore. Like I, I'm, I'm just going to be as good as I could be so we could be everyone. That was like my main thing. And then I came back to Rough Already. I remember Matthew, Matthew working everything to get me back to Rough Already. Shout out and to I, Matthew Ryder. Yeah, Matthew Ryder, man. Did so much for us. But I remember, I remember coming back uh, and I was like, yo, I'm going to make sure everyone is talking about Brixton and South London. I don't care what go put on a show. I, that whole year. Uh, after our season finished in high school at Blair, I was working every day with nothing on my mind but Rough and Ready. That's I was great. coming back for Rough and Ready to let people know. And to me, that's where everything changed. You know, and, and I always say this to people, there's got to be events in your life that at the time it seemed so bad, but that's actually when you come back later, it's what made you. You know, so for you, what was that event back, you know, back in, before you left to the U.S.? Yeah, like I said, I think that event for me was 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 rough and ready because it was like our version of the All American game, or just like if you're recognized by your peers and everybody else as one of the better players, then that's that's like a step in the right direction. And I wasn't even one of the better players on in my age group, let alone on my team. And you know, I remember seeing you know my brother uh, at rough and ready, and I remember him, and I, I know you could tell this story too. But I remember him, something happened, and he was like, next play, I'm going to come down, and I'm going to dunk it. And I'm like, I had never seen anybody do anything like that before. And I mind you, I'm still in awe because I'm seeing my brother in this element that I had never seen him before and watching him perform and be the, the guy that people are talking about. So he, he says, "I'm watch what I do next. Comes down, makes a move, and just dunks over everybody. And the crowd goes insane. And I'm like, yo, they're reacting like this to my brother. This is in London. This is in London. Like, you have to understand, rough and ready, like, even when I first moved to the U.S., like, that was on my mind, too. Rough and ready was, was, was the way for me. Like, I was like, forget being all state. Forget being all American. I want to go back to London where I left a certain way, and I want to come back and, and show people that I've put in work and that I've been able to achieve something, and I'm better. And that's when you get the respect. Like, I didn't want respect from from colleges or respect from coaches in the U.S. I wanted the respect of my peers and the people I grew up with in London. And I just remember telling myself, like, you got to get to that rough and ready stage. You have to get to the rough and ready stage. And it was funny, and Matthew can attest to this, this is, um, I think you're getting ready to go to Duke, and um, it's my freshman year at GW. And not to go too far into the next episode, but I remember coming back and I landed on like a Thursday or Friday, the Friday, you know, we always used to fly back for Rough and Ready the night before. So I flew back the Friday and meeting up with Andrew, um, Andrew Olu and a couple other people. And, and Andrew was pissed about something. I'm like, yo, what's wrong? And he's like, Luau is um, either going to miss his flight or not going to make it. And they want you to play for South London, for South. And you were so like, happy. What? And mind nah, you, nah, you were my so brother happy. played for South, and yes, I played you for Hackney. Nah, huh? you were so happy inside. Bro. You were probably like, man, I can't wait to nah. represent South London. What? Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and, I Matthew, you, and you, the point Matthew make was a legitimate one. But as a kid, I wasn't buying it. I remember um, uh, I remember him saying, look, the Wild's not here. Your brother's from your brother played for for Brixton, and you you filling in for South London is, is going to be, you know, a good just a good makeup. And I was like, but it's all about where you're from, and if South London doesn't have all the players that we have, that's not my fault, bro. That's on you, man. <laughs> bro, South London. If we go down player for player, South London, you know, got all the best players from England. Whoa, whoa, whoa! But, whoa, but whoa, we're not whoa, gonna whoa, go. Whoa, this whoa, is whoa, not for this episode. Whoa, it's not whoa, for this episode. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I want whoa, you to go whoa, and do whoa, your whoa. research. Put the names together for next time. This the is not names. For this research. But look, bro. let's talk about the jersey, though. You probably you should wear it on the next episode. But you probably have a frame hung, hanging up somewhere. What my rough and ready jersey? The South one, though. The South one. No, I never did it. So this is what I told, I told Matthew oh, wait, and happened? Andrew. And this is what I was like, yo, yes, Andrew. 
Andrew was like, there's no way, if Pups plays for South, nobody's playing. Ox, Ox, Ox Matthew, if he says, if, 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 if Sully said this, Sully was like, if Pups plays for South, then nobody's playing. But see, see, that's I was what like I mean. 18, 19 at the time. Who was I going to say something? I was just excited to be on that, on, in, in that atmosphere and be in that element. And I remember Sully saying that, and, and, and Matthew was pissed. He was like, you guys are not going to make it competitive. And, you know, it was the first year um, after Joe had passed. So it was like, there's no way I'm, um, I can play for South especially after the year year after Joe Pops. Okay, and, yeah, I see um, that. I'm skipping a year, though, because I forgot about playing in the under-19 game. And it's funny, you know, dunks are worth three points. And I remember what my brother did. And talking to one of my close friends, one of my best friends, who was one of the best players I had seen at the time, Trevor, Trevor Huston, I was like, what's this? And I came down and did something. And, like, I dunked it, like, two or three times in a row. And... That's the first time that that was a turning point for me to be like, wow, like I was able to will myself to do something on this stage. Maybe I have a chance to do something special. So that was another like rough and ready and performing, not only making it to rough and ready, but performing on that level too was another, was a turning point for me in my career. Yeah. Let's talk. Let, I want to switch a little bit. I want to talk about just the, you know, cause I, I, I want people to know just your mindset uh, and my mindset right before going um, to I'm the sorry. US. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just saw something where someone said Chizzo had the most bounce in, in, in London, period. Maybe in South London. Chizzo. Bro, see, you're, you're taking it back to, first of all, first of all, Chizzo, Chizzo was the best athlete. In, 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 in our team, right? So I don't doubt And nobody it. knows I'm it. That shows you how good athletes. That's why my brother had to go to South London. What you mean nobody knows you guys it? Didn't have you, no athletes there. You were gone by then. This is Chizzo. This how is, old is Chizzo? Justin. What are you Chizzo, about? Justin. This is when they keep. This is their turn. Oh, you that's, were, that's, you, the, that's, you, that's the young brothers. That's the, that's nah, the, you were in uh, Hunt School by that time. That's, but we'll that's, come that's back. the young <laughs> We'll come back. We'll come back now. But, uh, no, nah, I really, I want people, I, I want us to talk a little bit about, because the mindset of you're going to the U.S., you're about to go to high school in the U.S., and we both know we had, uh, you know, Jimmy and Joe, we had, you know, Brixton and Hatney, but what, it, it was still hard for us to get court time. It, it, it was really hard to, you know, to find a place to, to work out, because, you know, we had, practices that's the only time you could get on the court you you know had a hard time working on your game and just getting in gyms uh i remember so many gyms that wouldn't let us in because they had to let badminton um or handball or whatever is going on and we had to just take a train to another gym and another gym and wait outside some days we just wait and then you couldn't get in so and there's still you know a lot of kids that are dealing with it. So I just wanted you to share a little bit. What was, how were you going around that? You know, what's the way to go around that? And how were you keeping up with working on your game and everything? Man, it's interesting, man. When we wasn't, when we was back, when I came back home, it was, um, I, I didn't really know anything about drills and working on your game and stuff like that until I moved to the U.S. I never understood that or, or knew what, uh, kind of work you had to put in to get better. I just thought if I went to training consistently, I would get better. So that's all I had. And I remember that the point you're making, I remember when we both came back in the summer one time, we there was no gym access. We couldn't do anything. So we had to go. Um, I remember I had to take the Victoria line all the way to Brixton um, so that we could sneak in, so that we could sneak into the Brixton wreck to play. And I knew Again, in regards to you, at that point, I knew you was going to, you definitely had a chance to go to a major Division One school and had a, a chance also to make it to the NBA. So I was like, look, if I can get some individual court time with this guy and see where my, see if I can compete with him, compete with you on this level, then I'll, I'll, I'll do the rest. If, and so when we got there, I was nervous. Cause it was going to be the first time you and I were going to work 
out together and against each other on a, on an individual basis. So I'm like, man, is it, he's either going to show me that I'm not on this level and I can't compete, or I'm going to find out something about myself that I never knew before today. So the whole time we're at Bricks and Rec, and it was dark. I remember that. We, we, we snuck into Bricks and Rec. It was like 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and it was dark in the gym. And I remember just like, I was like, so what do you do when you come in the gym by yourself? He was like, well, I wake up at um, I wake up at six o'clock in the morning at Blair and I go full court by myself. And I'm like, yo, this guy's mad. But I'm thinking, look, this is how you have to think if you want to get to that level. So I was like, let's do it. So I was just following everything you were doing, following everything you were doing, just anticipating when it was time to compete, whether it was shooting drills, ball handling drills, or just playing one-on-one. And I remember we was we were playing one on one and going back and forth and I'm like man like I know at least defensively I can compete with, I can guard this guy I can compete with him but he's like making and like you're making like these extra moves I'm thinking I'm playing good defense and you'll make another move and hit a shot and I'm like okay you know like, this is next level so I'm looking at and I'm really looking at you as a barometer and thinking like yo everything this guy is doing can I add this to my game or can I can I build on that because this is what I need to do so we worked out a couple times and played then we played against each other in Hosanna um later that night and we we competed against each other too and I was like look he brings a different level of competition and work ethic to the game if I'm just able to emulate that it's over and that's when I kind of knew and I was only going into my sophomore year at GW so I knew that there's going to be opportunities to come. Yeah, my path is not going to allow me to go um, to go to, to the league after my sophomore year or freshman year. But I know if I continue to develop in due time, that chance is going to come. Yeah, you know, for me, I, and I always, uh, I always tell uh, my kids this at camps: um, you have to, with, with all the challenges and everything in London, you have to find a way to be creative in your hard work, you know? Cause uh, a lot of people would, would tell you they work hard, uh, but that definition really depends on who you're talking to and who's doing it, right? So for me, I found myself in, in a situation where at a young age, everyone was talking about, you know, Michael Deng or Luol Deng or how good, how good I was already. So I always felt the fear of, I can't let, these people down. People are speaking so highly of me. And it, and it wasn't until when I was at Brixton, I was playing with the juniors, I was playing with the men. I was still good, but I wasn't as good as I was later on, right? So every day, even though I'm going home and I'm like, you know, so-and-so just destroyed me today, you know, whether it was Marcus, it was Stafford, it was Lakin, it was Sean, it was whoever, right? So I took that to heart. I didn't care how old any, anyone was. So I kept pushing myself to be better than that person the next day, not later on, like, okay, I'm younger than them. Let me wait till later on. I just wanted to be better than them the next day. Then the next day I'll see after practice, so-and-so is doing sit-ups or push-ups or whatever. So I'm like, man, I got to do that. So I started to figure out how do I get to do that without them seeing me, right? So my biggest secret was I got to wake up at six in the morning and work out and come in later on in the day for practices and nobody knows that I did that. You know, it, it was my own little secret thing. So people were like, yo, his jump shot is nice or he could dribble. And they're like, you know, I'm only doing it at practice, but nobody knows I'm by myself doing it as much as I can just to be ahead of you, right? So I'm doing that every day and I'm trying to catch up to these guys, but they're older than me. You know, they're still better than me. They're older than me, but I'm catching up. I'm catching up. Not till Jimmy let me play with the England team and this was obviously i'm 85 i think i played with the 83 with the england team um and we went up to some tournament uh i went to the tournament and i kid you not i you know i was averaging almost 45 50 points in the tournament with crazy numbers i came back and that was the closest i ever played with you know um a group of guys that are almost my age but they're still older you know and that's when it hit me like yo i think i got a chance you know, and then I was like, okay, it's a year ago, and I go to the U.S. And I started looking, and I'm like, okay, here I have an older brother who probably one of the best things to ever come out of England, but he's the best high school player in the U.S. right now. He's in, 
you know, Sport Illustrated, everyone is talking about him. So I'm like, okay, I got to come ready when I go to the U.S. You mm -hmm. know, so I'm working, I'm working, I, I get to the U.S. And that's the story that, you know, we're going to share next time. But this is what was driving me to, to, you know, to push myself every day. So my message to all these young guys, honestly, is what you have is what you have. You have to find ways to be creative. And now that I look back, and especially with what we're doing, you and I, and traveling to Africa and seeing, you know, what's available and what's not there, you mm -hmm. look back at the UK and you're like, yo, I, I got outdoor courts that are nice. Um, you know, you, what are you really complaining about? You know, you come back to camp and I have some kids and I have to sit down with them and, and be like, listen, you have no idea. You know, you, you're taking the bus to practice. Some of these kids are walking, running. Some of these kids are borrowing their older brother's shoes or their dad's shoes to come to my drills, you know, or come to my camp. Here you are, you know, get your head to that next level where you realize and just be thankful for the level that you have. Stop comparing, you know, what you don't have to what you have. And, you know, and I try to tell them that, to teach them that, you know, deal, deal with it, work, work, work harder than anyone else, but hard work ain't the same for everyone. You know, your level of hard work is different for the next person. You got to create your own hard work, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's definitely true because, um, man, it's funny. Like I said, I used to have to travel at like 45 minutes to an hour on the bus. So it's like deep in North London to the other side of East, to, to Hackney, East London. And um, I remember my brother told me once, and I, trust me, I don't know how this is possible, but he does did it. And I know he's on the chat. This guy told me he rode a bike from our front door in Tottenham to Brixton. To Brixton. You know, I believe it. I, I'm going to tell no, you a story I, about Calvin. Calvin. I believe that's what I'm. Uh, that's what I'm trying to tell you. I, I'll never forget. I don't know the. Uh, and sorry to interrupt you, but this is no, a story I tell. I tell this story to Koja every time I see him. Every single time. I remember going back to uh, Rough and Ready. As soon as I walked in, I saw this guy jump from almost the free throw line. And I know people think I'm exaggerating. I opened the door as soon as I walked in the Rough and Ready, and I just saw him like this, just flying at me, right? And after he dumped it, he just landed and looked looked at the door and, just, and that image is forever with me so yeah. listen I this don't fool said he, he did that he, he rode the bike to to brixton for five straight weeks oh it, it takes it takes 45 minutes on the train on a train that doesn't run into traffic that doesn't get any any delays or well, it does now because it's, it's the two but he rode there to the other side of london so i heard that right yeah. um i heard that and then i was like you know what if i want to be like my brother and if i want to jump like him and dunk on people like him i guess i have to do it so i started doing it and i remember he bought me a bike and i started coming home from school early this when i really started taking basketball serious and riding my bike from my door to hackney and it was like springtime right around this time in the middle of like april may we're going to training and i'm riding the bike from training and I remember my brother bought me these Kobe's. Kobe's were the first pair of basketball sneakers I ever had, Adidas. And he bought me these Air Force Ones. And I remember Joe, who, um, we got to speak about Joe and Jimmy too. Um, I remember Joe was forcing us out to gym because we, the gym time was scarce. And I think like a volleyball team or a netball team was coming on after us and Joe had to get us out the gym. So I'm, I, I have one Kobe on and one Air Force One on, on my bike. I'm like, man, whatever. So I just start riding my bike. It's, it's like 6.30, 7 o'clock, and it's still nice outside. And I'm riding it, and my boy who's with me is a little bit ahead of me, Ken. I'm in, uh, I, I, I can And he's like a group of like five or six dudes. Stop him. And I pull up. And he points at me. So the guy, like, the dude comes up to me and they kind of surround me. And mind you, I'm from Tottenham. So I'm trying to figure out what is going on and why they're talking. And the dude asked me, is my name Michael? Got no no, no relevance towards you. But he's like, wait, wait, what, what, was, what, what was this, Brixton? This was in, no, 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 no. Uh, this I'm was about in, to this say, was... nah, you would have gone past, man. No, 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 no. It gets hey, you... better. <laughs> um, <laughs> this was in. It's in Haggerston, right, right after Stoke Newton in Hackney. And I remember he asked me this, this next question he asked me. And as I answered it, I was like, idiot. He asked me where I was from. 
And I was like, I'm from Tottenham, bro. Oh, and as soon as I said it, I was like, oh, no. When I tell you this skinny dude from behind the group comes out of nowhere with what looked like a Rambo knife and just swung it at me, man, I picked up the bike and it had to be out of a movie. I picked up the bike and I just start sprinting with the wheels down. I start sprinting and I jumped and both my feet landed on the pedal. And I just go, I'm going. I did. I, I probably lost them like two blocks away, but I rode for like 20 minutes straight without looking back. And that's the kind of things we had to go through. I had to go through to go to the other side of London just to play basketball. So when you said when you when we try to tell kids like you know I always used to laugh at older people when they'd be like oh if you knew what we went through during my day and this that, and the third, but that, those things are true. Like when 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 we tell people that my brother rode from. Well, 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 it's, it seems like 30 miles, but it's only like 10, 15 miles from Brixton to, to Tottenham. Like, he really did that. He really did that. And the things people go through to try and make it and to get to these, these um, to get to a certain point, like, people have to grasp and understand these kind of things. And I think wanting to be great and the inspiration that I got from Joe, who, um, you know, again, I, I wanted his approval. So when I left and people were like kind of perplexed or confused as to why I got the opportunity to go to the U.S., I always tell people when I came over here, I didn't come to the U.S. to play basketball. Yes, I played, but basketball wasn't my path. I was just going to school. Like I really felt like track was going to be my way to go. So when, it, when, when the opportunity came from, you know, granted by my cousin Eugene and my brother Kojo, when it came that I was going to play basketball, I was like, wow. This is this is bigger than what I ever thought, and I don't know. I have to succeed, like you said. I have to show the man them in South London what I'm doing. So I knew that I was playing for something bigger than basketball. I was playing for my family. I was playing for people coming after me. I was playing for Tottenham, for Hackney, for Joe, and I felt like I always had to represent when I stepped on the floor. Yeah, you know we've been we've been on this for a minute. So before before we get off. Mm -hmm. It's funny you said that story because it, it takes me back to, um, I remember back when I was, uh, before I left, um, I remember Jimmy gave me this weight vest. Uh, it was a Bloody green. Bloody Sheldon just signed on. Sheldon signed on, the guy who ended my college career. Well, what a way to end this with Sheldon signing on. Bloody what uh, happened? Sheldon Williams from Duke just signed hey, on. Hey, that's the landlord, man. You know what it is. <laughs> that's, that's that well, man carrying us to the final four. I don't that's, got that's, the ring this month. Nah, I'm forever thankful to him for my ring. Listen, <laughs> that man carried us to the final four. That's crazy. But, uh, uh, no, uh, you know, Jimmy Jimmy gave uh, a weight vest. And I remember I, I, I didn't want to wear that weight vest. I was like, man, you know, like Jimmy used to just say, you're skinny, you know, like you're soft. You got to get stronger. Here's a weight vest, you know, wear this. Used to make me wear it to practice and then just started making me wear it at home. It wasn't until one day I decided to wear it under my school shirt. Right? So I wore it under my <laughs> you school wore shirt. Under your school shirt? Bruh, I used to wear it all day. I wore it under my school shirt. I buttoned up my shirt, right? Go put my tie on. I go up to St. Mary's, right? And I remember, I remember one of the, the kids were like, yo, Michael was buff, you know? Like, yo, you know, Thomas. I was like, yo, I'm wearing <laughs> I'm wearing this from now on, man. And it, it turned out, you know, it helped me. It helped me so much the rest of my career. But I was really wearing it because I was just, you know, in a playground, you know, when it's lunchtime. And I, I'm not going to talk back about what Michael Deng used to do at lunchtime. But, <laughs> bro, life changed, man, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know, so just taking that, man, just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny that we're talking about turning, you know, certain things into positive and, it's it's really it's huge to let you know kids know today that sometimes what you're going through is a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know it might be tough at the time, but you got to do your best to get through it. But it's 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 really a good thing, and this is why we want to do this. This is why we want to, you know, do the five episodes because there's so much to talk about and so many people to connect to. You know, I right. think, you know, we just touching one base and people that are connected with us, and we spoke a lot about London, but. There's so much into coming to high school uh, that we got to talk about in the future. There's so much about the college recruiting. And